<laughs> Emily, now. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. On behalf of the DC Task Force on Jails and Justice, we are delighted to see you here today. We appreciate your coming and your caring. <clears throat> it's pretty crowded in here, and we're live streaming also. Um, and that's because of the importance of this work and the real sense of urgency that we have. My own personal story is that my internship in college back in the day was at the Euclid Halfway House for inmates within six months of release. Uh, after college, I went to work at Lorton Prison and was appalled by the waste of human beings just locked up forever, far longer than they needed to be. I became a criminal defense lawyer for 10 years, and we represented more than 2,000 people. So for me, this work is personal. I know it is for you, excuse me, for you too. For nine months, a hardy, hard-charging group of dedicated leaders in DC, from the government, from policy and uh, uh, research organizations, from the community-based organizations and uh, the faith community, uh, and most importantly, uh, people whose lives have been directly impacted by incarceration have come together to do this work. And from day one, there was great agreement that our jail just doesn't serve our needs. We adopted a mission, and our mission is nothing short of redefining DC's approach to incarceration by building citywide engagement, centering the voices of those with lived experience, understanding community priorities, and exploring the use and design of both secure detention and community-based solutions. We saw in the paper yesterday in Oklahoma, the state with the largest incarceration rate in the country, commuted 527 sentences, and that'll be 2,000 by the end of the year. What is Oklahoma understanding that we're not yet understanding? The city council in, in New York voted to close Rikers. Unbelievable. Uh, they're investing in community solutions. We have so much to learn and we're on that task. We can do this. The research included engaging 2,000 members of the community in focus groups, envisioning community sessions, a town hall, and a survey. We heard, uh, that, and all of that was organized by the National Reentry Network for Returning Citizens. Thank you, Courtney Stewart and your crew. Uh, we, we had the analysis of the local corrections data supplied by Metropolitan Police Department and the Department of Corrections, and all analyzed by the Vera Institute, another partner. Thank you, Vera. Uh, we looked at evidence-based practices, what works here and what's working elsewhere. And we heard your voices calling for change, not just to the physical structure, but to the policies that default to incarceration as the only solution to community safety. That's just not right. We de developed four committees. Uh, the first was community investment and alternatives to the criminal justice system. And ANC Commissioner Terrell Holcomb uh, chairs that committee. The Decarceration Committee, and LaShonia Thompson L. Uh, of Women Involved with Reentry Efforts, WIRE, chaired that subcommittee. Uh, local Control, Carl Racine and John Bowker co chaired that subcommittee or committee. And Facilities and Services, Charles Allen and Linda Harley Harper. Uh, who's the Senior Deputy Director of the DC D DYRS. Um, she's an advisor. Thank you to all of those great leaders. We have a number of members of the advisory committee. Can, can you stand and be recognized and thanked? John, that's you. Others, <laughs> stand. Members of the, advi the advisors, thank you. Um, <clears throat> this report 
Um, and I am so happy to see it in this published form, it's very exciting, uh, is the product of an enormous amount of work. Uh, the task force deliberated for countless hours, uh, and every, every uh, recommendation was voted on by a supermajority. And as you might imagine, that wasn't easy. We didn't always agree, but we went back to our core values. And those were a sense of urgency. We have to plan and envision a public health approach to community safety and incarceration, and we have to do it now. We have accountability, a second core value, to the public, transparency, using evidence-based practices, and results-oriented. We heard, uh, sorry, I flipped the wrong page. Um, so, so those four committees came together to do the hard work, and they helped us realize uh, this report, and we are so grateful. Um, in closing, we're going to present, uh, I'm sorry, I flipped the wrong page. Okay, the third core value is equity, uh, justice administered fairly. We need to acknowledge the racism and the past uh, policies rooted in other systems of oppression as well. And the fourth core value is compassion. We're motivated by a love for every person. We recognize the false dichotomy often drawn between victims and offenders. Um, we, we believe that everyone who comes in contact with the system should be treated with dignity and respect, have a chance for exercising their uh, experiences with, with restorative justice and a healing-centered care approach. And all of these values are reflected in the 17 recommendations that we made. All right, in phase two, which will end September 2020, between now and then, we'll be seeking further impact from you, we'll be taking your feedback, and we'll be developing implementation plans. Um, it, I can't wait for the next phase to be on, ongoing. So what is our agenda today? We're excited to dig into the details. We're going to kick off with a, a conversation between Kevin Donahue and Charles Allen uh, from the um, uh, executive and the legislative branches, and they're going to talk about how they're going to move forward. Uh, then we're going to have our two partners, the National Reentry uh, Network for Returning Citizens and VERA, share some of their findings. Uh, then we're going to have the task force members, advisors uh, from four committees, and we're going to do a deep dive into the recommendations. Uh, and finally, more task force and advisors are going to engage in a, in a Q&A with you. And we really look forward to that. I want to introduce Misty Thomas, the fabulous executive director of the Council for Court Excellence. CCE facilitated all of the work that we have done, and we are so grateful. A fabulous job. Hi, good morning, everyone. And on behalf of CCE, which is an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization here in the district with the mission to serve or to enhance our justice system to serve the public equitably. We are really proud to have been able to develop and support this task force. It obviously is critical to our mission, and we think the future of incarceration in the district is of a paramount importance. Uh, so I'm pleased to have the chance to facilitate a conversation and introduce two leaders um, of the district who responded to the call for more community engagement on these issues and who recognized the need for a comprehensive look at sort of the five W's of incarceration. Who, for what, um, where, when, and why incarcerate? And um, all of those questions are critical to be answered before you simply build a building or change a structure um, or replace an old jail. So those leaders are Council Member Charles Allen, Ward 6 representative and chair of the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety. Yeah, come on up. And Kevin Donahue, District's Deputy Mayor for Public Safety and Justice. Thank you both for being part of this task force and for sharing your expertise and for being interested in listening to and learning from the lived experiences of people of our community. So let's chat. I'm going to come sit with you, I think. Um, but I will. So the first question for you, 
Mics need to be green, all right. Let's start at the highest level, which is why to each of you was it important to be part of this task force? And I, I'll pause just to the group. I know a lot of you are seeing the full report for the first time, and maybe you're seeing the list of members for the first time. But it is a really diverse, dynamic group of people mixed with those with lived experiences, service experiences, sub academic expertise, governmental leadership expertise, and you know beyond. And so it's a really dynamic group but with a lot of different views. So why did you see this as something worth your time and the district's energy? Yeah. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you, thank you. Misty. Uh, I'll start with, of course, thanks to like so many people. Um, this has been a long process, but really uh, benefited from having so many stakeholders uh, just fully engaged at the table, discussing. I think we worked really hard, and the credit goes to CCE and their team of helping create a very uh, safe space where there's a lot of candor and a lot of ability to kind of put the things on the table and uh, know that you weren't going to find it on Twitter 30 minutes later. Uh, so it really helped us have very good, frank conversations. And I don't think that we would have gotten to this place without that. So I really appreciate the hard work there. Thank you. Um, for me, I, why it was really important for us to be able to, to have this um, and be a part of this is we, we know that our current facility um, needed to be replaced yesterday. Um, it's outdated. It was built at a time when we thought about incarceration very differently. Um, we are, we've got some incredible programming taking place there, actually, but we're really having to kind of shoehorn that into our spaces, and I think a lot of credit goes to Quincy and Kevin for just being incredibly creative and supportive of some really great ideas that are happening. Um, but, but it's not sustainable, and so we know we have to build something. And what we wanted to do, and this is why I put the funding in the budget to kind of create this process, was that we wanted to be, take a big step back. And before we start talking about what the dollars should be or, or what the pink color should be or selecting bricks, we need to actually have a much bigger conversation around our system and what role does a facility play in it. Does it give us an opportunity to rethink the way in which our system works? Because clearly decisions that were made 50 years ago um, are not working. And if we truly are committed to being a, a safe and a just city, um, it would be a real wasted opportunity if in the middle of this conversation about what would a new facility or facilities look like if we didn't actually go through a very comprehensive process to look at the whole system. And so that's what attracted me to this was that as the chair of Judiciary and Public Safety, a lot of the decisions that we make, I touch a lot of them um, on the whole gamut. And obviously a building is only going to be dealing with once someone is actually in that building, and the system is much bigger than that. But if we use this as an opportunity to help us really reframe and rethink uh, what our system could look like, the ways in which we try to tackle straight on the absolute gross inequities that we see that take place uh, within the system, then that's the opportunity in front of us. And so that's why I was really excited to be a part of it and really grateful for all the hard work that, that went into it. Um, and I will just give one quick um, Thanks as well, again, to, to Kevin and Quincy. Um, I, I remember a conversation Kevin and I had a, a while back where we recognized, um, you know, the, the jobs that we're in right now are not always going to be the jobs that we're in. Um, and so I'm not always going to be the Ward 6 Council member. I'm not always going to be the Chair of Judiciary and Public Safety. But if I have a moment to try to work with partners to help think and set us on a path and set us on a course that's the right thing for the city, then I want to be able to do that. And um, a lot of credit's got to go to, I think, Kevin and Quincy and the whole team because they came to the table um, in a way that was incredibly collaborative and, and it's tough to ask partners to rethink the thing that they're doing right now and be able to hear it in a way that isn't criticizing them but enrolling and, and having them be a part of uh, where we're headed. And so I'm really grateful for that and I think that's led to a really great product and something that I think between both branches of government we can kind of rally around and start moving forward. Um, second what you said. Um, first, thanks for everyone who participated. Um, for those who didn't, we spent entire days um, together, literally entire days, um, uh, trying to sort through the different issues and challenges uh, and uh, negotiate um, uh, verb types um, and adjective usage um, <laughs> to try to get where we are here, uh, which is a, an important step in the journey towards a not just a new uh, building, uh, but a new system. Um, so uh, I'll just say um, uh, jails are hard to fund. Um, no one really wants to um, because they represent not the best, but often the worst of our society. Um, and 
uh, there's a recognition that the journey is going to be a long one. Uh, and I think for me, it's my participation is important because really what's important is the existence of the task force and having the community lead the effort. Um, Charles is right. The timeline to develop this, um, uh, even if we're successful, is such that there could be different people in the official government roles. The community is the one who's going to make this happen. Uh, the advocates are the ones who will make any change to our system happen and lasting. And to be able to have a discussion about a new facility, which we do need, a new one for the reasons that Charles mentioned, but having that in the context of having it be not just part of a system-wide reform, but be a necessary aspect of a system-wide reform that makes us a more equitable and just city um, is something that has to be forged by those who are outside of government who spend their life doing this and will continue to focus on these issues um, long after Charles and I may be uh, gone and different people will be in our seats. So this is the right way to lead it, and I, didn't, I was a mere participant of the 25 or so people who were on the task force, and that was the right way to do it. Well, you, you both weren't mere participants in the sense that we really are grateful, and I think the city is grateful that you heard the call for the need for more community engagement and views, and that funding came through to support some of this work, and that came through the council, and that came through OVSJG and the mayor's office, and I think that that reflects the, the real commitment and how seriously the city is taking these next steps, and it's wonderful. And, you know, we did talk, you, both of you just spoke about the need for it sort of to be community-led and, and the community engagement piece of this. Community is can be a buzzword right it can mean a lot of things and i know that um, my colleagues um, are going to speak in a little bit about courtney's going to speak about the community engagement work we did and, and the data collection that we did but um we I, i'd love as you've been at the table and heard about the different feedback we've gotten and the different methods that we sought to engage all corners of this city people who wear all different types of hats and who've had all different lived experiences and impacts i'd love to hear sort of what you thought um, as a sort of teaser to the folks who are going to get to dig in and read the report and see some of the details of that feedback, what you thought was most interesting, surprising, or important from the community engagement to date. And, and it's not done for the task force, but what do you think has been most interesting to date from you? Um, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, so uh, going in, uh, you, you created an ambition that this can't just be about a new facility. It has to be about a new system of which a facility is one part. And... Uh, the most important feedback for me was to trying to take that very general mission statement and pretty wide scope and try to translate it into um, actionable, practical elements uh, that will get further fleshed out in phase two of this work. Um, but what does it actually mean? And so the, with, it started with breaking into the subcommittees. Um, so decarceration, community investments, facilities and programs, uh, local control. And then beyond that, to recommendations or observations around uh, what does it mean to have more community investment that is targeted at trying to produce the number of people entering the system? What does it mean for local control? So um, seeing where those conversations went organically, uh, naturally, based on the flow of the discussion, I know when um, the chairs started these committees, they did not start with an end in mind. We kind of let the group take the conversation where it was going to go. Uh, so that was the most helpful, um, a, a, a very different issue, but the data is very useful. Um, I've seen this data in various sorts and sets. I've not seen it so clearly, thoughtfully, or, um, uh, you know, it, it uh, portrayed in detail. Uh, and I think um, it provides a stark um, uh, set of facts um, that I think we can continue to take recommendations and respond to. I'll, I'll pause you for a second. We are thrilled that we're able to live stream today, but that also means that we're getting some feedback loop potentially from some of the people participating. So if you're participating from the internet, hello, please put your phone or computer on mute so we're not getting feedback in the room. Um, and yeah, so your, your take on community engagement. Thank you, Kevin. Um, a lot of what Kevin said I certainly agree with. I'll, um, I guess, as Misty said, community can be defined in a lot of different ways. Um, and so to me, there were two big ones that I thought were both I'm not entirely surprised by, but it was also very very good to hear and kind of reaffirm what I think I, I at least felt and heard by anecdote. One of those was, as the Ward 6 council member, I have a unique relationship to this conversation because I represent the neighborhoods that are immediately adjacent to the current facility. And they've 
the, the current jail has been their neighbor for 50 years. Um, but there is always the conversation. I have certainly seen whenever there is a conversation around where should a facility be located, um, so let alone the conversation of what should be done, but just the location of where. Um, I have seen plenty of times when those conversations about going into other places just hit a, a community buzzsaw. Um, but what we heard from a lot of neighbors within Ward 6 and within Hill East was, of course we care about the details and let's work on how we get it right, but um, these, are, these are our neighbors. And so this really isn't a big deal um, in terms of where, it should, where a facility or facilities could be cited. Um, and so it was good to see that reaffirmed in conversation. The other one was um, the broader community really did seem to, um, to, to want us to have this conversation and to work on what are the alternatives to incarceration? Um, what are the ways in which we build a system that is not just a uh, punitive lock someone in a cage uh, type of system? That it really, there was a real appetite for having a conversation around getting at root causes of trauma, root causes of violence, root causes of criminal activity um, in ways that are much more based around uh, restorative justice and, um, and alternatives to long sentencing and long incarceration, um, because I think that conversation, at least in the district, I hope elsewhere, has really evolved in a way that um, I, gotta, I certainly feel like we saw a lot of people wanting to have that conversation and wanting to push us to, to help lead in that direction. Yeah. Well, you're right. So the task force, and you'll see in the report, made 17 specific recommendations um, with all of those lenses in mind and the principles that Shelley outlined. Um, and several of those speak to community investments to prevent justice system involvement and changes that would ultimately lead to less incarceration or incarcerating fewer people in, in the district in the future. And so to your point of what do we set on the path, what do you two see as the things that have to happen in the district to sort of move those, those recommendations forward? We obviously are going to have a phase two of the task force to flesh out some detail using your smart brains and all of those who participated, but wearing the hats that you have, what do you see as the things that need to happen to start to move these balls forward? I think um, we have taken some steps, and I think that we are wanting to move as aggressively and powerfully as we can when we talk about root causes of violence and root causes of trauma. And I think that, again, came through through a lot of the work. Um, I think about the still incredibly new work that's taking place with the Austin Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, with the Attorney General's uh, CURE model. Um, we just went through in this most recent budget where uh, the deputy mayor had proposed some different place-based trauma uh, centers. There, there's a really big push, but in the context of our entire system, it's actually just a fraction, but it's a really big push around how do we get at violence interruption, violence prevention, working at addressing underlying root causes and root experiences of trauma. And, um, and I think that that, to me, is something that we've, we've just heard such positive feedback from the community about that push and that importance in that regard. Um, and, they, and I think it's coming from a place of not just folks who are looking at an immediate public safety concern and say, uh, I'm concerned about safety in my neighborhood. I'm getting people now that are saying, so where's, where's the violence interruption taking place? Where, where's the Office of Neighborhood Safety Engagement? Um, they are, they're aware of and wanting to see that, which is great, because that also then comes in on the side of being a, creating a much more just system um, that's trying to get at those causes. And I, th I think that we are, um, I know the people sitting in these seats believe strongly in that work and are pushing hard to help make sure that we are moving aggressively. I think that's one of the pieces. Um, and again, in the context of if we're talking about a facility, there's actually a whole lot of conversation going around how do we actually avoid anyone ever coming into contact with this bricks and mortar that we're talking about. Yeah, Kevin, what do you see as, as next and where, it is, where does your office want us to, uh, to tackle? There's a lot of what's next. Yeah. I, think, um, I think the work, you're going to have hard work in fleshing out what that looks like. We. Uh, we. we. <laughs> I know. We. <laughs> the we. Um, all of us. Um, uh, I, I would say um, very quickly, it, it's, it's programs particularly around mental health, substance abuse, housing, employment that are by their initial design, designed to help individuals um, who have been caught up in the system uh, and are at risk of doing so, not as a benefit of a program, but as the intention from the very beginning and day one of designing that program. Uh, I think we also, you know, and these are some of the facts uh, outlined in the report, uh, is that uh, when someone goes into the system 
and in the facility once, there's a high likelihood just by stepping into the building that they're going to be in the building a second, third, and fourth time. And we have to recognize that our justice system, the uh, inflow into it is a reflection of the failure of our reentry. Um, and if we can't have a more open, just, uh, and equitable um, system that gives individuals coming back a sense of place, a sense of hope, and connection to the rest of the city, um, then we're going to, and then we have practical programs and laws that encourage that. Um, I think those are the investments that we can see reducing the, continue to reduce the overall population level. Now I see time's up, so I just want to uh -huh. say one. Yeah, please. I want to say one thing before yeah. they like stand up and start waving yeah. the times up. Is um, uh, is I, I read the New York Times story about the vote to close Rikers Island. They have I think till 2026. Mm -hmm. Now they could in theory extend that forever. Um, but uh, it reminds me, I've used the analogy of New Beginnings. Um, mm -hmm. So New Beginnings is our juvenile justice facility. And uh, it would not have probably, we've reformed the entire juvenile justice continuum and system. Uh, I don't think it would have worked if we had reformed everything but kept Oak Hill open till everything else was fixed. That's right. Yeah. Um, New Beginnings, just as Riker Islands, is the forcing mechanism. Mm -hmm. So you can lead or follow with a facility. Um, New York is sort of leading with one to the extent that it's going to be, if they're successful in building it, it's half the size of what Rikers have capacity for. So you, by the math, have to figure out how to reduce your population. Um, New Beginnings was built for, like, about 50 or so people. Um, they currently have far fewer than that in it. But it was, um, it didn't follow. It was an essential component of everything else. And I think, um, I think from an investment standpoint, um, uh, I think we have to think of a new facility as one that isn't what you get at the end of a long process, but as an essential component and sometimes forcing those other elements to happen successfully a smaller facility, a more humane one, and one that reflects the vision and values of the city. Well, thank you both for your participation, and I know we'll have folks who will want more opportunity to engage with you and ask questions, and we look forward to working with you in the phase two. Thank Excellent. you. Thanks. Morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Courtney Stewart, and I'm the chairman for the uh, National Reentry Network for Returning Citizens. Glad to see you all here today. Uh, I want to thank you for being here, and I, me and my partner Emily are going to try to get through this particular exercise. So, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate my team over there, the National Reentry Network for Returning Citizens. the hard work that we have done. We are proud of the deep community, uh, community engagement work uh, that we have led for the task force. The style of community, this style of community engagement is a model for what is possible in the District of Columbia. And uh, we are really excited to give you an overview of the findings of the report today. Um, but remember, this is just a highlight. Everyone has the report in front of you. There's so much uh, more deep and rich information in there. So, so please do take a look when you have a moment. Um, before we dive into the details here, I, I just wanted to introduce myself as well. My name is Emily Tatro. I'm the Deputy Director with the Council for Court Excellence. Um, reiterate Courtney's thanks for everyone showing up here this morning. Um, and also thank you to Covington um, for hosting and, and providing breakfast this morning. We really appreciate the use of their space um, to hold all of these people um, and, and also to share the live stream so that people can join us online as well. Okay, so we can get started. <clears throat> we we'll start with the history of the corrections in the District of Columbia. Okay, so first, the first jail was in 1838. It was also known as a slave pen because alleged runaways were held there um, and it housed about 200 people at the time. The old DC jail in 1875 was crowded after 20 years, but used for at least 100 years. So think about that. 
Presidential Commission created Lawton to fix it, but overcrowding persisted. In 1972, the jail uprising in the motto of Attica, taking 12 hostages, no one killed, grew into two major lawsuits and the construction of a new facility. That new facility was CDF, uh, the DC jail that we have now. Um, it's built in an old architectural model that doesn't allow for very much visibility and has almost no programming space. Uh, it, it's in a state of disrepair now that required the mayor to propose uh, more than a $77 million in the capital budget for repairs over the next six years. We also have a secondary jail next door, the Correctional Treatment Facility, um, that opened its doors in 1992 and for 20 years was run privately by um, CCA Core Civic and has come back since um, 2017 now, has come back to local control, is, using, is, is being used by the DOC for more programming space, um, but still has fairly limited use. Uh, we also have the prisons of the BOP. Um, Lorton got shut down after the 2001 Revitalization Act, or after the 1997 Revitalization Act passed, um, and we have about 4,500 people who are spread between 120 prisons around the United States of America right now. Um, I, I'm, we wanted to talk about this history because we've, you know, we've had five facilities of our own here, plus the BOP, and, and none of these correctional institutions have solved the problems of the other ones. Um, and the task force has done a lot of thinking about what it means uh, to talk about a facility, but also to talk about deep policy change in a way that can change the way that we are incarcerating people in the district. So that brings us to uh, the recent history, um, our corrections data analysis, the trends in the District of Columbia. So more than 10,000 people were uh, in the DOC custody in 2018. On any given day in 2018, an average of 2,059 people were in custody uh, at the DC jail, CTF, or halfway houses. The average daily population uh, was about 92% male, 92% black, and 76% from wards five, seven, and eight. So for this analysis, uh, we took people who were being, who are in custody on holds, meaning that they're there because of warrants or because of transfers for other jurisdictions like Maryland, Virginia, or the federal government. Um, that's about 34% of the DOC's population. And we put them aside because they're not there because of DC law and there's nothing about DC law that can, can change that population. We focused instead on the 36% of people who are in the jail on any given day who are there unsentenced, um, the 14% who are there serving D sentences under DC law, and um, the 16% who are there because of violations of um, probation, parole, or community supervision. And what we did was we aggregated charges into charging groups. And what you see here is a look at the bookings, how many people came into the DOC in 2018 um, in, these, in the top 10 charging groups, which account for about 85% of all of the people who came in through the jail. Um, and as you can see, violations, simple assault, and drug offenses make up over a third of all the bookings that we had in the jail in 2018. Now we're going to take a look at ADP instead. ADP is average daily population. And this is instead of looking at every single person who comes through the door, we're averaging and we're looking at any given day in the jail. Um, and this is a little bit different because ADP skews a little towards more serious offenses because they are people who are going to, um, who have longer stays. Um, and so here you, you see homicides rise to the top um, and aggravated assaults closer to the top, but you still see um, that drug offenses and simple assault are making up a significant portion, um, almost 20% of the average daily population in DC jail. Now, this was the number we wanted to share with you because this was something that the task force saw and, and was seeing for the first time. This is a bunch of people who are really deeply <laughs> rooted in a lot of the statistics about the jail, but this is a number we had never looked at before. This is median length of stay um, for people who are unsentenced by both charge and race. Um, and you can see that for ne nearly every charge category, um, with the only exceptions being weapons and vandalism, 
black people had longer median unsentenced lengths of stay than white people on those charges. So are being held longer pretrial at the DC jail. There's one caveat to these numbers, which is that there aren't a whole lot of white people in DC jail at all. Um, and so drawing those statistical comparisons is difficult um, when you don't necessarily, for all of these charge categories, have, have many people to draw against. We also wanted to look at non-hold releases by length of stay. So the orange category here is for unsentenced people, people who were pretrial. Um, and of the people who were released in 2018 from DC jail, 41% of them are in this orange category. They're unsentenced. Um, and, and, and as you can see there in the first two bars, about 23% of the unsentenced people are released within a week or less of being at the jail which raised a big question for the task force, which is if a person only has to spend a week or less in jail, why do they have to spend any time in jail at all? What is that actually doing for community safety? Um, and, and what benefit does that have um, where we know the long list of really negative impacts that that can have just those short stays on someone's life? Um, another interesting number from these releases is um, that about 20% of people were released um, after being booked for a violation of their supervision. And of those people who were, re were released, four in 10 of them um, were released with their parole reinstated. Um, and so that's something to think about too as we move forward. You'll hear a couple of recommendations around the Parole Commission. Um, why are 40% of the people being left straight back to the community um, after being booked on a violation? Okay. One more slide here. Um, we wanted to do a quick uh, overview of um, bookings and average daily population by uh, people with diagnosed serious mental illnesses or substance use disorders. You can see here about two thirds of the people who were booked um, have either one diagnosis or both. Um, in the report, we break down by diagnosis by charge categories, um, and we also break out data across the board for young adults and for women. We don't have enough time to go into those categories today, um, but please make sure you check the report for more detail, and we can answer any questions you have about that during the Q&A portion. All right, thank you. Okay, so we've talked about the numbers, so let's talk about who's in the jail for what and how long but what does incarceration actually mean in D.C.? All right, so that brings us to the community engagement that we did, okay? So we had 177 participants. We did 21 stakeholder groups. Uh, we had 50 participants uh, in the uh, community visiting workshops that we did. And we had surveys of uh, 1,700 or more uh, individuals participated in our surveys. So we engaged returning citizens, we engaged family members of incarcerated people, people currently incarcerated in the jail, crime victims and victim advocates, uh, uh, the jail correctional officers and staff, neighbors of the jail, people experiencing homelessness, and other interested community members. We ran focus groups in the communities, uh, visit workshops and surveys, both online and in person at events. We touched nearly 2,000 community members. Okay, so the question was asked, built from one kind of engagement to the next, but we're grouped into two major categories, people's opinions and community safety and their opinions about incarceration. Okay, so responsive to the statement, crime is a big problem in my neighborhood. So let's talk about safety first. In the survey, we asked people to say how much they agree with the statement. Crime is a big problem in my neighborhood. For this analysis, we broke people into subgroups by ward, by race, by whether they identified as a crime victim and whether they had a history of incarceration. We also uh, asked people to rate the statement, incarceration is the best way to handle people to get arrested. As you can see, the people who feel least safe are those who have been incarcerated and are victims of crimes. 70% of every subgroup analyzed disagreed. Even among respondents who are the most likely to see crime as a big problem in, the, in their neighborhood, they are unlikely to see jail as the best solution. At least two-thirds of all subgroups analyzed agreed with this statement. 
We should hold people in jail prior to conviction only if they pose a high risk to community safety. So some of the safety themes uh, that came out of the focus groups, we had a space to, dip, to, to uh, dive deeper into these community safety themes. Close-knit communities, making sure community, making sure people in the community felt supported and can identify with one another. Housing, housing insecurity was identified as the root of many safety issues. Police, DC is over police, find alternatives to responding to community crisis, behavioral health, bolster mental health resources and treatment outside institutions. Prison should not be the first option. Okay, so some of those things, I get out in two months and I'm scared to death. That's one of them. Community empowerment, a say-so is how we invest. Support for youth, I deal with folks who are incarcerated at very young age, at a very young age because there are not systems and support in place for children who have been exposed to trauma and uh, jobs and economic opportunity. You can do resume writing programs and job training programs. What comes after that? Okay. Okay, so some of the opinion on the construction of a jail we also asked questions more directly about a jail, including the survey question where we asked whether the current jail was meeting DC's needs, and if not, whether we should put no money toward a new jail, renovate the old jail, or construct a new jail. Less than 6% of the respondents think the current jail meets our needs. A plurality of respondents want either renovation or construction. While a substantial minority don't think any money should be spent on a new jail, black respondents and those who have been inside one of DC's jails in the last five years for any reason are the least likely to respond with I don't know, which suggests an overall much stronger opinion on jail construction. Though those responses remain relatively split between no money, renovation, and or construction, Crime victims are slightly more likely to advocate for construction than non-crime victims, though in general, both groups report high levels of I don't know. This is, okay, I don't even know that word, <laughs> so I'm going to pass. Crime victims by race and war shows relatively similar patterns as overall results by race and war. Okay. So some of the jail things, reducing incarceration rates. I am completely against the jail unless other resources are brought to bear to bring the incarceration rates down. Not does DC need a new jail, but how, to, how do we keep people out of jail? Why are they coming back to jail? How can we make our jail smaller? That's a question that should be circulated. Abolition and anti-new jail views, views in favor of a new facility, philosophy and incarceration and decarceration, programs and services for incarcerated people, conditions of confinement, prison population. So as you can see, there's a lot there. Um, we include a, a lot more quotes directly from people, a lot more um, analyzed statistics in the report. There's actually an entire supplemental community engagement report too, um, because there's so much information there, we couldn't fit it all within the 50 pages here. So please do check that out online. Um, but the, the top line conclusions that we had, the, the big three takeaways for the task force um, were really these three here. First, um, that engagement participants don't believe that the current facilities are serving DC's needs and don't want people to be incarcerated in any facility that they don't see as meeting the needs of the district. Um, second, that there's urgent concern over the conditions of the current jails. And third, that demand is high for community investment in housing and mental wellness and youth programming and job basic needs, um, jobs, alternatives to the police, 
and in large part because of a preference for addressing crime both through crime prevention um, and through community-based interventions in crisis. So we have a panel up next of task force leaders who are going to tell you more about how these community engagement findings help to shape their ultimate recommendations. Shelley, you want to come up and introduce everyone? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Courtney. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, I want to bring up Tyrell Holcomb, chairman of the Advisory Neighborhood Commission 7F. Uh, and chair of the Committee on Community Investments and Alternatives to the Criminal Justice System. Is Terrell here? Oh, good. right in front of me. Thank you. Uh, Lashania Thompson L., uh, Executive Director of The Wire, Women Involved in Reentry Efforts, and chair of the Committee on Decarceration. Oh, waiting for her. Okay. Uh, jo We're going to get to those questions later on then. Uh, John Bowker, partner at Aaron Fox and my co-professor in state and local government, uh, course. Uh, and with uh, Carl Racine, he is the chair of the uh, Local Control Committee. And finally, Linda Harley Harper, sorry, <laughs> senior deputy director, DC uh, DYRS, and co-chair with Council Member Allen of the Committee on Facilities and Services. So I'm going to put you right to work. Let me start by saying, panelists, we have 33 minutes, and they gave me 150 questions. So your answers have to be crisp and short, OK? Uh, would you each say why this work is important to you? And I just mean a minute. Start with you, Terrell. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this work is important to me uh, as a fourth generation Washingtonian uh, who's had a number of uh, friends incarcerated. Um, I have a brother uh, who for uh, my nephew is 13 years old, and I'd say for a period of about 10 years or so, he was uh, in and out of prison. Uh, and then I have a cousin who was doing 93 years um, uh, in prison as well. And so uh, this work is important for me because it's hit home. Uh, it's really hit close to home, uh, and I believe that it is important if we are going to look at how we break the cycles of not just systemic poverty, but if we're going to break the cycles of mass incarceration, we've got to be real, uh, and we've got to get to the root causes of the issue uh, and ensuring that we have investments before we look at uh, incarceration. Thank you, Terrell. John? Thanks, Shelley, uh, and thanks, Council for Court Excellence, for a fantastic job uh, with the report. Um, so I was there kind of at the creation in terms of the Revitalization Act um, and the system that we have today with respect to our folks being strewn all about the country in BOP facilities. So I regard this work for me as kind of an act of redemption in some ways, um, if I can play even a small role in helping to bring those folks back um, and to uh, undo the broken promise of the federal government um, to have those folks be closer to the district. Um, and so it's very important to me, particularly as co-chair of the local uh, government committee, to be able to put forward strong recommendations with, with my co-chair, Carl Racine, that will help bring folks back closer to the district, into the district, to be there with family and supports. Uh, because as you all know, all the data show that that is the best way um, to prevent uh, recidivism, um, and also to, to welcome folks back into the community. Thank you. Linda? Yes. Good morning. Uh, I think that uh, for me, you know, this work is really important. I've been working with young people in the juvenile justice system in the deepest end of the juvenile justice system for many years. And um, I've grown uh, over those years, and my lens has changed. But one thing that I have learned and where, where I feel very strongly as a Washingtonian is that healthy families make healthy communities. And I know that the young people that I serve in, at DYRS, I know that the young people who are in the deepest end of the system, their families need helps and supports. 
And I know that I see the impact firsthand when a parent is incarcerated and one of our young people is in at home. I see and I feel it, and we all do too. And I think that um, it is going to be the key to making our community safe for us to really focus on healthy families. And so the work that I've done with the young people, I'm really excited about the possibility of transitioning the lessons that we've learned in reforming the district's juvenile justice system. And we still have more reforms to do, but to move that into the adult system. And um, it's just a really exciting time in the district. I'm excited about it. Thank you, Linda. Um, so each of your committees developed a set of written guiding principles uh, before you came up with your recommendations. Why was that important? Terrell? So for me, all right, got to stop cutting this mic off. Uh, so for me, it was important uh, for us to develop the guiding principles um, in, in the committee that uh, we served on. I, I, I'll, I'll be candid and, and be honest with you. Uh, when I got the call to be a part of the task force, uh, I was hesitant at first, uh, especially as an African-American man and, and understanding the impact and effects uh, that mass incarceration has had on so many communities of, of African-American African communities across the country uh, and specifically in the District of Columbia. Uh, a portion of me was hesitant in understanding that um, the ultimate goal or the, 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 the body or the consensus uh, in looking at the current conditions at D.C. jail is that the city at some point may need to invest uh, in building a new jail. Uh, and I in no way support uh, us putting our dollars into uh, building a facility that would incarcerate individuals, uh, but that we have to first focus on investments. And so for us as a committee, our guiding principle was we don't even want to have the conversation about incarceration. Investments need to be the first and foremost uh, forerunning thing in our city. Um, we can't speak to any other city, uh, but in D.C., investments needs to be the first forerunner. Uh, guiding principle of what it is that we are doing as a government, uh, as a people, and that if the dollars are there, if the programming is there, uh, if the opportunities are there, then we can prevent incarceration, and incarceration is not a conversation that comes up. Uh, and so looking at individuals, uh, as my cousin who's known 93 years, he was incarcerated uh, as a juvenile, and when he returned home, he didn't find the support and services that he need and ended up finding himself uh, in a situation that essentially has cost him uh, the remainder of his life to be behind bars. And so looking at how we ensure the investments are there uh, and that we prevent recidivism rates, if we ensure the investments are there in the beginning, uh, that our young people that need uh, the support and services, the most vulnerable individuals need those support and services, uh, then we don't have the, the same cycle uh, that we've been going through uh, as a people. And so so for us, it was really, really important to understand that our guiding principle uh, before we make any recommendation is that we want to ensure that the investments are there um, because we recognize that our city is very prosperous and healthy uh, from a financial standpoint. And so that if we make the investments now, uh, people can have a promise in tomorrow. John, thank you. Yeah, I, th I think for our committee, starting with uh, principles was very important because once we uh, developed the principles and agreed to those principles that made our recommendations very easy. I think there was very quick consensus around the table that local control was important, um, not just in terms of democracy and having control you know, over our own affairs, which folks certainly agreed with, um, but also all of the benefits that came with local control, local connections, local supports, local decision making um, that is critically important when we're talking about how we're going to handle our own population. So we, we started with the notion of, you know, statehood gets us everything that we want, but, you know, that's probably not going to happen, you know, any time in the, in the near term. Bite your um, tongue. <laughs> I hope it will. Um, but our criminal justice system is so intertwined with the feds, given the Revitalization Act, you know, the judges, the courts, uh, the prisons, um, the, the, the local prosecutorial function in the U.S. attorney, that if we were to try and, and unpack all of that and make a recommendation writ large, we would in some ways be dealing with a problem, you know, as big as the, as the statehood issue. Um, so we decided in terms of our principles to focus on those things that we thought were the most urgent and that perhaps we could, you know, make strong recommendations about now and actually change with respect to you know, our 4,000 folks who are strewn all about the country in 117 BOP facilities in terms of the uh, U.S. Parole Commission, you know, making decisions 
about our population without knowing, you know, anything about our culture and about how we, you know, view uh, principles of, of, of decarceration and, and trauma, you know, uh, informed uh, 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 learning and all of the rest of it. Um, and also with respect to halfway houses, once folks get back here, having those deep connections, you know, into the community um, and not having a situation where we have only two halfway houses, you know, that are, that are overcrowded. So we thought that these were things that we could, you know, deal with right now and make strong recommendations about, even as we looked into the future and, and all believed very deeply that having local control over our entire criminal justice system um, was, was an important value and something that ultimately we all wanted. Linda, thank you. So uh, on our Committee of Facilities and Services, we uh, took a lot of time going over the data and the history of corrections in the city and really realizing um, and acknowledging the historical inequalities um, that the city has experienced over time. We um, took time to really acknowledge the history and then we moved from there to really make a um, consensus agreement that all of the recommendations that came out of the committee would prioritize the dignity and the humanity for persons who find themselves system involved and incarcerated. And so we, we made sure that all of the recommendations that came from our committee were in line with the task force's values of compassion. And so it was really refreshing to be a part of a group where everyone in the room uh, could acknowledge that it was on the same page. That's nice. Linda, you were part of um, closing down Oak Hill and opening new beginnings. How did that work impact you? And, and if you could speak a little bit about that, how did that impact your work on this task force? Uh, it's been interesting over the years. As I look back, I've seen different uh, seen it differently, uh, you know, as you grow and learn and change, uh, you know, all of that happens back to back. But what I will say is that um, I really see a lot of um, ways that the district can learn from the experience that we had of building new beginnings and all of the outcry from lots of persons in the community who did not believe that we should have a smaller facility. And um, I think that uh, we had a leader, a director at that time, Vinny Chiraldi, who um, was a pusher. He's a pusher, right? That's what he does. He's a very <laughs> strong person, and he pushed me to really see things differently. He pushed all of us that worked there to see things differently, and I never, it was very hard to be in it and to try to imagine a time where we would have empty beds at Oak Hill. Um, at New Beginnings. And um, now we have empty beds. Uh, we have young people who are at New Beginnings receiving trauma-informed services. And we have a whole continuum of community-based services to make sure that when young people are uh, nonviolent offenders and not a risk to the community, that they're able to live and, and be in the community with supportive services to help their success. And so that is directly transferable to adults. It's exactly what we want. Um, I had the, the honor of being at DC jail yesterday to be a part of um, Director Booth's Women's Empowerment Conference, and it is so refreshing to be um, a part of seeing some positivity going on in a really drab, drab place. But for Director Booth, who I want to commend on his ability to um, see, be able to see that to have shiny, we still can do right by people no matter what the building is and to treat them humanely. But what really stuck out for me even last night was thinking about, there was a question about, so all of the women who were incarcerated at DC jail in one room and asking how many were moms, and the majority of the women raised their hands. And all I could think about was, I bet so many of them have impacted young people who will conversely become, if they're not already system involved, and that we have to find a way as a city to break the cycle. Thank you. Terrell, your committee changed its name from criminal justice investments and community alternatives to community investments and alternatives to the criminal justice system. Why did the members think that was important to do? So again, I believe that we uh, believed it was really important uh, to 
change the name because we wanted to ensure that it was understood and clear uh, that our priority is on investments. Um, that if we um, invest today, we understand that it is uh, easier to build strong uh, young people than it is to try to repair broken men. Uh, one of the quotes from uh, the late uh, Frederick Douglass, understanding that if you make the investments um, and that we put the emphasis on the investments uh, and not necessarily incarceration. And so we wanted to make it clear uh, that we want our city to focus on community investments and understanding how all of uh, the impacts and implications uh, that are had. Uh, example, I'm a commissioner in a district that has a, a local Safeway. Uh, and so if an individual uh, who has a family is caught shoplifting in the Safeway, they're not shoplifting because they want to shoplift to go and sell. They're shoplifting because they have a family to feed. And so if we ensure that our investments are there uh, for individuals that commit this type of crime, which is, you know, really based on a true story from the conversations that I've had with the store management of Safeway. Uh, and so if we want to ensure that our, 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 our residents in the city um, really understand that the city cares not just about development and not just about developers, but we care about people uh, and that power lies within people. And so we understand and have really understood that in order to uh, really project uh, that stance that we needed to change the name of the committee uh, and understanding that um, this is a larger conversation to continue to be had as it pertains to criminal justice reform and uh, there's only but so much we felt like as a committee we could do to really push that conversation. However, we felt that if we could talk about the investments that needed to be made, we could talk about the funding uh, that needs to be implemented, the funding that needs to be maintained, uh, and even some of the funding that needs to be increased, um, we believe that we could have that impact that many of us on the committee desire to see. Um, and really looking at it from a, a lens where it's not uh, just a, a group of uh, activists who all see the same way or see through the same lens, uh, but it's individuals from different avenues and different perspectives that all see through the same lens and understand that perspective um, that we, got, we have to ensure that our city is investing uh, for the folks that are the most vulnerable, for the folks that are most likely to commit crimes, uh, and also to looking at how we dispel uh, the prison to pipeline trauma, the, the prison to pipeline, uh, school to prison pipeline, but then also to looking at how we dispel the trauma to prison pipeline as well. Uh, and so many of our communities have been adversely impacted by trauma. Uh, young people, there are young people that cannot take tests because when it's quiet, they think that at some point they're going to hear a gun go off. Um, and so really understanding how we tackle these challenges early so that we don't end up in the same circumstances and going through the same cycles later on down the line. Um, and so really for us, changing the name uh, was more than just a name change. It was to ensure that folks understand that the investments must be made. Thank you. John, the Local Control Committee made the very tough decision to, to bring, to recommend a piecemeal return uh, of local control to the just, to justice system functions instead of doing it wholesale. Why was that and how did you choose which pieces to start with? Yeah, so, so again, I think that, you know, we recognized pretty early on that particularly in phase one, it was just too great a task um, for us to figure out, you know, how to unpack the federal government from, from our system, how to de disentangle the federal government from our system, given, as I said earlier, that, you know, the courts and the judges and the prisons and the prosecutorial functions and other functions, uh, U.S. Parole Commission and the like, you know, are all part and parcel of, of our system. And, you know, I think about a story um, that, you know, uh, one of our committee members shared with us that really brought home, frankly, for me, what we should be focusing on in this first phase. And he told a story about how when he was released somewhere out in one of those 117 BOP facilities, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away from the District of Columbia, um, that they gave him uh, some money for bus fare to get back to the District of Columbia. And when he got to the bus station, it wasn't enough money to get back. So he had to go around the bus station and beg to get the rest of the money to get home. And for me, that story really, really brought home what we should be focusing on in this first phase, which is getting those folks back to the District of Columbia, particularly the most vulnerable populations, and particularly those populations who are, who are close to release. So that seemed like you know, a very easy recommendation you know, for, us, for us to make, um, as well as the U.S. Parole Commission um, which is being sunset, as many of you know, 
um, in 2020. So it's a decision that the city is going to have to make anyway as to how to handle that function locally. So it made sense to us to fold that recommendation in as well because that's something that's right upon us. Um, and then also we put in the recommendation about, about the halfway houses um, because obviously, you know, that's a critical, you know, piece of, of, of this as well. Th thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> Linda, your committee recommended that any secure detention facility, and we used that term thoughtfully as opposed to jail, any secure detention facility be built to host a long list of important services. What will the committee do in phase two to ensure that those needed supports aren't only available to a person who is incarcerated, but also when they're living in the community itself? And I think this ties back to the earlier question about learning lessons from new beginnings. I think that we really, um, it's very hard to build a bicycle and ride it at the same time, but we know that we have to have community supports in place. Um, we have to, we know that we have to create a system in the district that doesn't default to incarceration. And so the number of in and out folks at DC jail uh, is proof that they're not a threat to public safety. It's a proof that we could have done something different, made different decisions, that we did not have to immediately move to incarceration. If you spend two days incarcerated, why did I have to do those two days anyway if I'm eventually returning home to the community? And I think that, but once I get to the community, I need supports in place. And so I think to help to push the system, not to default to incarceration, um, means that we have to have services and supports in the community first and foremost. And so the committee realized that. I think that the focus, um, even the, uh, our committee was facilities and services. Most of the committee talk was, was focused around service delivery. I think that um, it's really the primary focus and desire to create a, um, a, a long and rich, robust continuum of care for um, adults in the, in the system. Thank you. So I'm going to pose a couple of more general questions to, and any of you can answer. Um, <clears throat> the task force found, just to build on what you were saying, uh, the task force found that 23% of the people who were unsentenced when they were released spent a week or less in jail. Why is it important to target that group for decarceration? I, I, I know that, and I'll just say, Part of the discussion was the disruption that even a week plays in terms of employment, education, child and other family care uh, is so destructive that it doesn't seem worth it in most cases to keep people locked up. Um, was there further discussion about that? Well, we definitely had a lot of discussion around it, and I think that um, we certainly realize that, um, you know, the statistics show that once you go for one day, you're, the chances are you're going to come back. And so that decision about having somebody to spend the night in jail, it, it not, it's not just a decision for them. It's a decision that impacts the whole future trajectory of an, an individual. Absolutely. So why is it important that people be able to serve the last year of their felony sentences in D.C.? Um, that was a big conversation across all the committees, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and does that mean we have to build a jail? Yeah, well, I would say with respect to our committee's work um, that it was critically important for us because these are the folks who need the most support because these are the folks who are, who are coming back. And so whether it's um, being close to family and local supports, um, whether it's access to legal counsel for all of the things um, that are happening in that last period before, before you come home, um, and then most critically perhaps is the providing of the reentry uh, services that are going to be critical to the success of that person's um, coming home to, to the community. So, so we thought that it was very important that um, certainly that we bring the entire population back, um, but particularly to focus on that population which, 
um, has its last you know, year before it's coming home, um, and also vulnerable populations as well. And um, with respect to whether or not you know, we need to build a new prison, um, there are a number of different ways that you could do this, and we talked about that a little bit. Um, not all of those ways require um, the district itself building a prison. Um, but I think those are conversations that need to happen in phase two. Um, and I think those are conversations that obviously and appropriately are going to be with elected officials um, and folks in the district to have that conversation about exactly how that should go. Because if you, if you talk to folks around the time of the revitalization, there actually was an effort um, to explore siting a prison in the district or close by the district. We can argue about how robust you know, that, um, you know, that discussion actually was. Um, but there was you know, community opposition to it at the time. Um, so this is going to have to be you know, a, a deep conversation among all of us as to how we do this. But I think bearing in mind, first and foremost, the important values uh, of local control and why, why it's important, particularly for those folks who are, who are on their way home. Thank you, John. Um, the committee, your committee, Tyrell, local investments, um, d divided the report into three major sections, prevention, response, and reentry. Why was that? So understanding that uh, as we look at the system uh, as a whole, uh, understanding that we want to prevent um, folks from going to prison in the first place, but we also, too, want to respond uh, and have responses in place when we notice that there are uh, those indicators that are there. Uh, we talked um, already, I've mentioned about trauma. Uh, so the response to trauma and looking at how we deal with trauma is that a lot of young people who experience trauma uh, at some point or another may end up committing crime. Um, and so if we look at the way in which we're responding to trauma, uh, that in turn could also allow us to prevent crime as well. Um, and so there's an old adage uh, that uh, as a kid my mom used to tell me is that hurt people hurt people. Um, and as, a, as I became older and as an adult now, I understand really what that means. So there are a number of people in our communities that are hurting. Uh, they've experienced trauma, uh, and some of it has become normalized. Some of our young people have become normalized in certain settings. Um, I know for me, I live uh, in a community where um, there's a train. The, the train comes by so often during the night um, that I'm not disturbed by it at night anymore. Uh, I went on travel this summer. I came back. My first night back, I could not sleep because I was just so disturbed because I had been in a place that was so quiet for so long. And it really shows me, uh, f from a personal perspective, that same level of impact that many of our young people have from that trauma perspective. So understanding that we want to prevent, we want to have responses, we want to ensure that our response to trauma, our response to individuals that are committing crime, uh, our response to individuals in communities uh, that have high concentration of poverty, uh, that ha have high levels of incarceration. Um, there are young people who say that I want to spend, I want to be able to see my father. Uh, I'll never forget this. Uh, some years ago, I was working with the mentorship program, and a young man said that I want to go to prison so that I can be with my father. Um, and so understanding the implications and impacts uh, that, that are had in the way in which we respond, but then also to looking at reentry. Uh, we have to be real with ourselves and understand uh, that there are a number of, uh, of our members and our residents in our community that are going to be coming home uh, and returning home. And so one of the things that I'm proud of uh, with my older brother, when he returned home, uh, the first thing that he wanted to do was start a business um, because he recognized that there were some challenges and barriers that were there for him, but then also to some of the folks that are returning home in the community as well. And so if he felt he feels as if if he can himself become an entrepreneur and be able to uplift himself, that he could also provide opportunity for other uh, individuals that have records uh, and be able to ensure that they can provide for them fam provide for their families without having to be set back and go back to prison. We have one last minute, so I'm going to ask each of you to take 20 seconds. What's the last thing you want to leave us with? Terrell, start with you. The last thing that I, I would really want to leave uh, us with is that uh, to ensure that this framework uh, leads the conversation in our city uh, and that we ensure the investments are there, uh, that we ensure that individuals in our communities uh, all have the same uh, opportunity to succeed in life, no matter where they come from, no matter what they look like, uh, no matter what their past may be, um, and that we can live uh, and have opportunities um, no matter where you're from. John? Yeah, I, I would challenge us all here um, to make this the beginning of the conversation, not the end of the conversation. There's a lot of very important work that's gone into this and into these recommendations, um, but it's going to take each one of us 
you know, to work hard to make sure that those recommendations um, are brought to, to reality. And so I'm looking forward to phase two, and I'm looking forward to the participation of everyone in this room and outside of this room um, to help make all that happen. Um, I, th I think that we have to remember that um, our, the way that we perceive the District of Columbia, how the district perceives those who are com returning from incarceration speaks a lot about our character. I think that how we uh, treat and, and how we see and how we believe that we should invest in persons who have made mistakes um, speaks a lot to who we are. And I think that the district has shown that we are leaders all the time. And I think that we can continue to push the system to be even better. Um, we've done well with the juvenile justice system and to continue the reform efforts in the adult system is something that we really need to do. I, I think it's so um, exciting to see all of the reform conversations nationally um, on social media, it's become a whole thing. But there was a time in the city where juvenile justice reform and um, the jail wasn't even a conversation. You know, DYRS was buried down in the Department of Human Services and no one, it was a last thought. And so the fact that now it's been lifted up, it's a cabinet level agency and the city views um, the juvenile justice reform efforts as positive, the fact that uh, we have people from all over the world who come to visit our juvenile justice system speaks volumes. And I think that we can do the exact same thing with the adult system. And I know that um, we have people who are already coming to visit our YME units at the jail. I think we just have to keep working. I think that we're on the right trajectory. And so I'm looking forward to phase two. Thank you all so much for your wonderful engagement and participation. All right, so we're going to ask that our Q&A panelists come up, um, and we're going to be circulating the room with microphones, so if you have a question, if you could just um, either raise your hand or stand up at your table, we'll make sure that we're moving around the room. Test. So well, I see we have a question already kitted up, but I, I have the easy job. I'm just going to basically point at you and try to help Shepard. So I, um, again, just want to say I'm so grateful to all of you for being part of this task force. and. Um, I am not going to go down and, and necessarily, well, I guess I can very quickly try to, so we'll start on Quincy Booth, the director of the D.C. Department of Corrections and task force member, Mark Schindler from the Justice Policy Institute, Tammy Seltzer from University Legal Services, and Paula Thompson from Voices for a Second Chance. And we're so grateful for all of you and your leadership and look forward to letting you get the, the hard job of not only facilitating questions about your own experience and probably some feedback on what others have said. So thank you for, for taking this hard task. We'll start right here. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Nazgul Gantnush with the Sentencing Project. My question is if you could, um, if you have any information about the violations, um, there is not much of a breakdown for whether those are technical violations, new offenses. Mm -hmm. If you have any sense of that, I think that would be really helpful to know. Or if you could suggest how we could find that out. And just a clarifying question, I'm wondering about the holds um, the, the f that are excluded in the analysis. Did, would that include people going into the BOP or uh, are those folks with DC code violations not included um, in the holds category? Thanks. <laughs> See, Mark, do you want to try to tackle a little bit on the, the, Actually, no. the first? I can. <laughs> So I can thank you, oh, Go yeah. right to the um, 
I can start to yeah. answer some of those questions. No, um, um, yes. Point, point to Emily. <laughs> so, uh, the the hold category it includes anyone, yes, who is so if they have been approved for tra transfer to BOP and are waiting for them for pickup, then they are in that hold category. Um, as far as the violations go. The Veer Institute um, put together a technical addendum to explain some of the more specifics. That's up on our website, so you can grab that there. Um, but the short version of the story is um, that we we used for violations for all of these um, for this whole analysis, we used people's top charge, so whatever was listed as most serious. Um, so for the people who were listed as violations, the violation was their most serious charge, um, which almost always means that there isn't a criminal charge. Um, so those are almost all technical violations. Mm -hmm. yeah. My name is uh, Charlie Sullivan. I'm with the organization CURE. Uh, and I also uh, chair uh, a committee uh, on Rethink DC Corrections that meets once a month. Anybody wants to come is certainly welcome. Um, and I chair Outside the Box Committee. So uh, I'd like to share two thoughts in regard to being outside the box that even my co-chair, uh, Sam Kaplan, does not agree with one of them, I think. So anyway, I think, first of all, the first is, I think we have the most liberal people running our criminal justice system that perhaps we will ever have. When you have everyone on the city council co-sponsoring voting by people in prison, including the attorney general and the mayor, I don't know how we can go anywhere but down. This city is becoming gentrified. If there is, as we know, with the Department of Justice, for example, has changed radically when somebody else got in. So the first recommendation, and it just is something just to look at, what about taking truly the politics out of the running of the jail and having a non-profit private jail operation? Non-profit, tax-exempt organization running the jail instead of, as it is now, the city council, which can change whatever. And that's the first recommendation. Uh, there is... Uh, it's on the books. There is, uh, there was a seminar at Yale about 10 years ago that they made, made a good argument for this. I can send this to anybody that wants to see it. Uh, we have it online and it's, you know, it makes the arguments back and forth. Something to consider. And then the second recommendation is a lot shorter, but I think we ought to look at maybe going uh, to New York City uh, they closed Rikers Island, and they're talking about regional jails someplace. And I realize we're not as big as New York City in space and whatever, but it's something we ought to think about in regard to localizing uh, some type of facility or whatever for people in the different wards that are returning, whether they be near their families, near help, near uh, employable uh, opportunities, et cetera. So those are the two recommendations. Well, I, if I can humor it, maybe to the to the panel. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I'd be interested in both of those. As you all see the next stage of this task force, you've detailed some really great recommendations. You've analyzed some information. Questions about further data details um, from our first question and our second about even other innovations, maybe even more detail and beyond the the contours of what you set out in this phase one report. Where do you, where do you where would any of you like to see this go next? Where do you want to see us dig in on maybe questions like this and innovations like that were just raised? I was actually going to answer what Charlie oh, said, oh, please, well, but by all means, please. I, I, I apologize. I didn't really hear um, the question. And and I do think the first recommendation you have is definitely not something that I think was discussed, and so that is something that the task force can discuss uh, as we delve more into. What are the recommendations? Um, the, the second piece that you talked about in terms of what they did in New York, obviously we are smaller. Um, I think we've had, there is a recommendation that says, specifically says that a new jail, if built, should be in the same area where it is now. And the reason for that 
is because there's already a jail there. And I think as the most recent experience we've had around trying to bring in a new halfway house has shown us, NIMBY issues are going to make it very, very difficult to locate the jail anywhere else besides where it is at the moment. Let me just reflect. Sammy, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, and, and it's almost an easy way out. But we should begin to challenge the entire community on the importance of reducing crime and to always go, particularly, it's not in where most of the crime is committed, but it's pretty close, and always go back to that that this NIMBY thing, maybe to take time and to begin to sell that to the community so that everybody I, is part of it. Um, I, I, I hear you, Charlie, and I, and I think that um, from my perspective, the community investment piece that so many people are focused on, um, at least we as a task force are focused on, is that where I think everybody has skin in the game? Everybody, even if it's you're not in one of the most effective wards, you're, you're, you should be actually, you know, contributing to community investment and advocating for it. I think, in some ways, the actual facility of the jail, and this may be controversial, is less important than the community investment in terms of preventing people from going into the jail in the first place or focusing on what we're doing for reentry. So there's going to be plenty, I think, in terms of uh, other kinds of services that are going to be available in lots of communities around the city. Um, the jail itself, though, is, is something, and, and we just don't have time to get into more of it, but, but that's really something where, yes, we did take the easy way out for that. And I think we're going to have plenty of work to do on a halfway house in terms, in terms of getting that somewhere in the city. Um, so we chose one, one, bat, one less battle. Mark, you so, were going to say something. So I would just say quickly, uh, Charlie, and I do love and encourage your out-of-the-box thinking always. Um, and just on the first point about who would run uh, a jail, uh, you know, as you know, I spent most of my career in the juvenile justice system, which is, you know, largely based on nonprofits, community-based organizations, a lot of investment. Um, I do think that uh, when we are talking about uh, incarcerating people, I think that's actually one thing that the government shouldn't delegate uh, to the private sector. Uh, I think there's a lot of issues around oversight and transparency and things like that. i um, happy to have that conversation with you uh, further. But as Tammy said, we didn't really discuss that uh, as part of the, the task force recommendation. But I think it's a, it's a worthwhile conversation to have. Paul or, or, or Quincy, do either of you have anything you'd like to to add right now and see if we can get you a question kiddied up. Yeah, please. Hi, uh, my name is Natasha. I am an organizer um, with the ACLU of DC. Um, I just kind of wanted to hear a little bit more on, um, there's been a lot of talk about community investment, um, over incarceration and school to prison pipeline, resource development, like all that sort of stuff. So I just kind of want to hear you guys expand on what you actually think that means. Like, what does that tangibly look like um, in conjunction, like, with what this task force is doing? Please. Hi, good morning. Nicole Porter with the Sentencing Project. So. Given no numbers have been shared this morning in terms of projected cost related to a new jail, but I wonder how this task force is going to balance any um, equitable distribution of resources or funding related to community investment and new jail facility since this entire discussion has been predicated on the assumption of not only a new jail, but also some sort of secure detention facility that would house the current DC code violators who are in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. So what does that look like and what will that look like in phase two in terms of making sure that there is an equitable prior, uh, prior, prioritization of resources towards community investments and also any new jail construction and or prison construction? Plus one on all that. Yeah. Um, I'll respond to the first part. I think that it was evident um, early on that we saw that there was clear disparities across wards involving resources and that investments needed to be made. Um, 
we talked a lot about how and where they should be. We know that in wards five, seven, and eight are often um, absent from the discussion when um, determinants are made about where to invest. And so, and that was one of the reasons why we felt strongly about changing the name of the committee is that we wanted to make it prevalent that there should be an investment first, that I think we approached our work um, from a prevention and an intervention standpoint. And I don't, it's not our job to figure out where um, the money comes from. I think our charge is to be adamant about the fact that there need to be investment in resources in those underserved communities. We also, uh, we dealt with the fact that race plays a significant portion in this. I mean, the city continues to be gentrified and there are particular pockets of the city that are really suffering. And so we felt it was important that we highlight that and that we really are putting the charge on our policymakers to figure out how to carve out funding to support those communities. Did anybody want to add? Yeah, I, I just want to say that um, there's a reason why the New Jail Task Force report, as you will see, is not really heavily focused on a new jail. Um, the reason there's even a, that committee on community investment and alternatives is because of how strongly people felt across the board that we know the research out there about what, how people end up in juvenile justice system, in the adult criminal legal system. We know how to prevent that for a lot of people. And we're not doing that, or we're not doing enough of it. And so I can, I can assure you that this task force is going to put a lot of focus on the community investment piece. And when we talk about that, we're talking about income disparity. We're talking about housing instability and homelessness. Um, uh, we're talking about employment. quality schools, employment, um, all of those things that we know can contribute to people ending up in the system, addressing trauma. That's a priority. I also want to say in terms of, and I'm sorry that um, Council Member Allen or Deputy Mayor Donahue are not here, the, um, to talk about the budget, the actual facility comes from a very different part of the budget. That's a capital budget issue, um, whereas uh, the other kinds of investment are part of the regular budget process. Um, should I look at Shay to get into more detail about that? So, so they're not competing against each other. That is, that is my understanding of the process as Deputy Mayor Donahue has explained it. Um, it so that's not, they're not in competition. Anybody want to correct me? Go. I do want to say that um, in the district juvenile justice system, I really don't need it, right? Uh, in the district's juvenile justice system, what we did was fund our community-based continuum through the savings realized by taking on a philosophy that keeping young people closer to home is um, benefits families, benefits the wallet, everything across the board. And also the city's overall push um, to no longer uh, incarcerate nonviolent offenders has drastically reduced the population. So what the city is faced with is really the really the high expense of operating a very old and huge jail that's outdated. And so there are cost savings to be realized by building a newer, more efficient jail and, and adopting some new philosophies that can help to fund and reinvest those monies into the community for community-based services. And so, I just to so add. Sure. if I can just go ahead, if I can just add to that, uh, so Linda and others have alluded to, you know, some of the lessons from the district's experience in the juvenile justice system. A few of us were around uh, during the the planning and um, uh, closure of Oak Hill and opening of New Beginnings. I think a, a little known um, fact is that when a bunch of us arrived in 2005. Uh, at the newly created executive branch agency of DYRS, uh, there was already plans and capital funding uh, for a new secure facility for kids out on the Oak Hill campus. That was, there were plans for a 350 bed facility um, that was funded. Um, and we quickly threw those plans in the trash 
um, and started on a process to assess what the actual uh, need might be. Um, turns out we were slightly off, right? Actually, the initial projections and hope was for a facility uh, with 40 beds. Various political factors pushed us to create a facility with 60 uh, beds, uh, which we now know essentially was too large. Um, and so, as uh, Deputy Mayor Donahue indicated earlier, I think we should really push ourselves to think small um, and then have that push us, right, in other ways to make sure that we make the investments appropriately. And I think the questions you're both asking is exactly the right question in terms of how we uh, make resource decisions. Um, you know, I'll just go back quickly. When, when we started the, you know, it's been mentioned a couple of times that um, committee uh, that became the Community Investments Committee was known as the Alternatives to Incarceration Committee, right? And the discussion was, um, and I would encourage us all to push on this notion and think this way, not to think of the community-based investments as alternatives, right? Because we all know what happens to the alternatives in a budget process, the first things to go, right? So I would really encourage us to push um, the task force, push our elected officials, that the last result resort alternative is somebody being locked up, right? I can, I can say, and we talked a lot about how race plays out, I'll say for my kids, all those things that happen in the community are not alternatives. That's the first thing we think about, right? Education, recreation, cultural things, uh, treatment options, that's always the first thing, and that's what we should be doing for every person in the district. Um, and so we really need to push ourselves. I really encourage us not to think about alternatives to incarceration. Let's think about community investments. And incarceration is the last resort alternative when all else fails and for as short a time as, as possible. And, and to address the question you asked, Misty, I see phase one as our value statement. This is where we have as a group and with community input the, these are our values. You know, we are not okay with the overrepresentation of African Americans in our in our criminal legal system. We are not okay with the overrepresentation of people with behavioral health disorders because of lack of treatment. People are being locked up. You know, we're, we're not okay with that, and we we want to focus on prevention and intervention to make sure that the only people who are in a secure facility. Are, are people as a last resort for, for whom you know, there's, there's nothing else that we can do in terms of community safety. Yeah, I, I think speaking to the two questioners, and I'm not a member of the task force, but I will just say that this today we wanted to get this report and this starting point in your hands. I'll remind that this was a six-month first pass of bringing this group together, really was to set vision and values and not yet answer implementation or prioritization questions. The 17 recommendations are not ranked. They are not in order of, of priority of this group. They are setting out the framework and vision that this group is going to work forward with and wanted to get this report and this energy and this all these bodies of, of brilliant people and caring people in your hands to start the feedback loop on this and to do the work then on what are cost issues, what are implementation issues, and what are prioritization issues in this framework of value. So please do remember that while we're thrilled to have this out and thrilled of what it's done, this is a, a framework and starting point of this dialogue to get more feedback from you to do that deeper thinking about specifics. So um, want to just be very clear that this is a, we think, a wonderful starting point but that's, that's really where we are. Um, and so those questions are the ones to be dug in on very much more. Um, and I, let, let's, John, and I think we have time for a couple more questions. Thank you. My name is John Stannard. I'm with the Church of Scientology's National Office, and I do our criminal justice advocacy work, mostly federal, but in the city I've been active with the Rethink Justice DC Coalition. Charlie is essentially the founder of that group. And I was pleased to be able to participate in the task force as an advisor to the local control committee. I want to shift gears a little bit, and I think this panel is going to be completely unfair for the question I'm going to ask. But um, one of the, th the, I think that what's come together around this task force, I've only been doing this now for about seven years. A lot of folks in this room are doing it a lot longer. But in those seven years, the broad participation amongst many different components of the city focusing around all of these issues for change. I've been, I'm like really encouraged by that. 
And now that we're starting to really talk about and think about what are we going to do, and I realize that subsequent phases, one of the things that just continues to jump out at me is how do we pay for it? The entanglement of the, one of the implications of the federal government entanglement is the federal government's paying for a huge portion of our criminal justice system. And I think that's almost like the 800-pound elephant in the room a little bit. So let's take the, uh, f what our committee came up with as sort of the low-hanging fruit of taking back local control was the parole board. We're right up front. We're right on the cusp of that. Uh, Congress only gave them another two years. The federal control of the control, uh, parole board ends at the end of next year. As, I, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, zero dollars have been budgeted by the city to take over that function. Um, it's, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it's a $3 million budget. The way the feds are spending the money, we could possibly do it cheaper. I don't know. So my question is, using that example, it's like right now, this is like these money decisions for that piece have to be decided in months, not years, or then that ship's going to continue to float downstream. So I'm interested in the panelists' thoughts about how do we address this finance issue. I do understand the capital budget and the operating budget are separate. I have been told, however, that the capital budget, while it doesn't compete with the operating budget, is competing with funding for schools, funding for repairing bridges, and so on and so forth. So I'd be interested in your guys' take on this, because I think without the money in place to do all the things we're talking about, I'm not sure how they get done. I mean, that, you do you want to take You're the one who deals mostly with the budget, <laughs> so I don't have to deal with that anymore. I, I, I don't think... I don't have an answer for you, to be candid with you. I think the reality... <clears throat> uh, that is my response, uh, <laughs> to be candid. <clears throat> to be candid with you, the, the honesty that Misty stated and others, this is a conversation that we're having, and this is sort of the baseline phase. There's many more things that we can do to sort of reimagine how we actually do this work that could potentially reduce the population um, overall, and so I think understanding that you're talking about the impact of what a new facility would cost, and that's collectively across the board, as well as if we take back this function, what that actually looks like. However, the reality of it is, and as the deputy mayor stated, as well as um, Mark alluded to as well, there's an opportunity for us to sort of get a few things right to have an impact that a that it positively, potentially, impacts families uh, while looking through the lens uh, of race. And so I think one of the things I want to caution us on, and I think it's important, we have people's lives in our hands, and it's important to operate with a sense of urgency. It's also important to operate with a sense of compassion, care, and thoughtfulness. Because sometimes, just because we are saying we need to do things, I've seen people do things in a level of trying to be fast, and they F things up at the end of the day. And it's not the impact people will never see uh, with the exception of the people that are working on the inside. And so I think that it's important when we do this work that we actually get it right because, again, it's not like we're making water bottles here. We are dealing with people's lives and the impact of policy decisions by virtue of us saying, hey, we want to do something without thoughtfully thinking it through. So I think it's important sort of the work that's been done by incorporating the voices of the community while also using data. And I think that's an important piece for us to continue to have as it relates to us moving forward. So to that end, I don't really have an answer that probably sort of satisfies um, your question, but I do think that we're definitely headed um, in the right direction. The one thing that I'll just caution us on, um, in addition to race um, in this city, um, as well as around the country, I think that if we sort of look through the lens that we look through with young people, um, I think we would be in a different space. So we always sort of have this same notion of, oh, with young people, they can get it right if we give them a second chance. And I've seen it time and time again. I've been in this work since 2004. We don't have that same thought process for adults. Once they turn 18, we get a different mindset of, oh, they got it right. It's now time to do something different. And I think if we look honestly, because I would say, and I haven't done a study on this. I have not. So do not quote me on this. And I see the time is, is up, so I'll try to keep my mouth shut. I was trying to be quiet because I know I can start going off and on. But 
we've had people that unfortunately have gone in as juveniles um, and potentially would never be released. And due to the work uh, that many people in this room, including Councilmember Allen's office, Shay, others, and Mark, uh, there's sort of a different conversation where some of the IRA folks are now coming home, right? Just anecdotally, and not to put anybody out there, we have a lot of the IRA folks in our care. They're still in a different space because they've missed, in some cases, 19, 20, 25 plus years. And so the reality of DC, what they remember, you know, 20 plus years ago and what they're seeing now, it's difficult and it's hard. And so I would just say, I would caution us, and I wouldn't say ageism is the appropriate word, but the same, again, lens that we look through as it relates to saying, oh, with juveniles, we can do this, because then everyone gets happy and joyful, but we do not have that same level of sort of conviction and commitment and passion towards adults. And if I can just quickly, so there, this is a really, I think, important point, and there, for folks that should know, there's a parallel sort of process going on here in, this, in, the, in the city that some folks are aware of. Um, when the district amended the Youth Rehabilitation Act in 2018, one of the requirements Councilmember Allen uh, put in that required the city to develop a strategic plan to respond to the needs of those young adults, uh, 25 and under. Uh, we're privileged to be working with the city on developing that. Um, and so we'll be looking for folks' uh, feedback on that plan. And we've had conversations with CCE because we know that these processes are sort of parallel right now. Uh, but the investment piece is huge. I mean, I think the conversation also, you know, we need to be having a conversation with folks on the Hill, right, about um, having monies come to the district over a phased period as we start to take back the responsibilities of running the criminal justice system. It can't happen tomorrow. It's a huge expense, but their money, you know, right now the district gets a, a, a payment, a federal payment. So that should be part of the negotiation as we take back responsibility. And then we also have to, you know, figure out ways to spend the district's local dollars much more effectively uh, in the community, uh, I think similar to the way it's happened in, in the juvenile justice system with smaller numbers. Well, and we've got could... time for, for one oh, more. So sorry. Can, I, can I just add one, one thing? I, I, in terms of the parole, I'm really glad that you brought that up, John, because for a few million dollars, we're talking about about a quarter of the population at the jail in BOP. I mean, we're, we're spending money on the jail for people who only have technical offenses, whereas under the old parole board, whatever problems there were, people were not incarcerated prior to their hearing. Mm -hmm. um, so right there, as Linda was talking about, the reinvestment, You've got so many people that we're not going to be paying for in other ways who are going to be in the community. And I think we also have to, you know, you, the community, and the larger community is going to be really important in terms of advocating for these kinds of resources and helping the city choose these priorities. I mean, we are already paying in so many ways so much money for human suffering um, that we really need to address. I mean, we're breaking up families, we're breaking up communities. Uh, we have people who are not employed, who should, you know, who could be employed and contributing in so many ways, and, and that's a cost, and we need to look at it that way as well. So we're going to do one more question now, but this is not the end of the questions for this task force. Folks will be here today to talk to you and ongoing. We were going to have more community feedback because we want you to read the report, dig in on all of the data and things we have, and engage with us on an ongoing basis in this coming year to get new ideas, figure out what the additional questions are and the needs. But for now, we'll add one more question before Shelley closes us out. Thank you. I had the opportunity to skim some of the report and I had a, came up with a question based on um, what I saw and some of the things I've heard today. Um, it sounds like the report reflects that people think that we can maybe build like a state of the art kind of facility that other cities would want to emulate. Um, and I'm curious about our responsibility to use this opportunity to be really critical about what jails actually accomplish and to dig into other ways, as folks have mentioned today, um, to create safety, such as community investments, and I'm wondering if anyone can share whether there has been any research done, um, maybe in conjunction with this report, that would suggest jails actually create any safety, reduce violence, or reduce incarceration over time. I don't know why everyone's looking at me. <laughs> uh, it's an excellent question. I, I think that um, if I want to make sure that I paraphrase your question correctly, it's sort of saying, 
um, has research been done to show the impact of if someone's incarcerated, do communities become safer? Is that your question? Yes. Yeah. Do they safer I'll let Mark start because I, I get blamed for certain things and he can say certain things and then I'll come in uh. in a second. <laughs> we'll take the heat. Um, I would say generally no. I mean, there is not a real correlation between incarceration and community safety. We've seen uh, jurisdictions where incarceration has declined very rapidly and crime has declined, has declined even more rapidly than in places that didn't have those steep declines in incarceration. So generally there's not a correlation. I think the, you know, the task force values and really came at this where uh, acknowledging that there, there may there likely are some situations where somebody, uh, because of their behavior, is such a current uh, threat to community safety that they can't be in the community. The feeling was that that's a very small number, much smaller than exists right now. Um, and so we have to think about that and plan for that. Um, but the, the great majority of our time, energy, and resources should be on all the other recommendations that we talked about in terms of community investments and things we can do to reduce the number of people um, who end up in some type of secure setting. Uh, you know, my, my former colleague and good friend, he's been alluded to a couple times this morning, Vinny Chiraldi, when we started the reforms here in D.C., um, God, we spent so much time and energy and resources talking about Oak Hill and New Beginnings. Right. Whereas now there's like, you know, 20 kids or something in that secure setting. Right. And Vinny always used to say in the justice system, we have an edifice complex. Right. <laughs> All we talk about is buildings. Right. Bricks and mortar. When we should. And, and that takes up so much of the conversation when we should be talking about all the other things. And, and I'll say and, you know, Tammy referred to this. I would say 98 percent of the conversation in the task force was not about the jail. Right? It was about all the things that we should be doing so that if we have a facility, which I think people acknowledge there's going to be something and there needs to be something to replace what exists, that it should be as small as possible and really shift the resources into things that the research does show work. So, so I think to add on to that question around safety, it depends on who you survey as far as safety. Right. And so I've been to many community meetings. It's even marketed on TV that people believe that um, if something happens, this person should be taken off the street immediately. Right. And to Mark's point, um, there is an impact that occurs to families, et cetera, et cetera. But oftentimes the individual is not a public threat. Uh, to the community. However, people often feel that way. And so I think part of this conversation is not just sort of the recommendations that we're coming up with and things of that sort. It's also an education process mm -hmm. that we're working through with educating members of the community because what I would venture to say, I've been in government since 2001 and so I've been here long enough to see people say, this person should go away to jail. However, when it then becomes on their block, then they're like, oh, please extend grace. Where's the alternatives? And so it's sort of a process that I think that we're working through of understanding that collectively this is us, you know. And so when we start to then understand that this is us and there's many different things that we can do as we talked about as far as community investments and not just necessarily community investments, how do we stand up as individuals within the community? Because, again, I think we're really quick to sort of run to, um, and I think there's amazing organizations and I'm not saying that. Right. But the thing that I'm certain that these organizations that are up here collectively that they get all the time, you fix it, you fix it, you fix it. Right. And then for me, you fix everything as well, too. But we never have partners in the community saying, how do I stand up as an individual citizen? And that is something that's beyond needed where men and women, as they're coming home from whether it's BOP or just regular, right? They still need a level of love and commitment within communities and not necessarily saying, hey, they needed a job. They just need people to be neighborly, just to be nice, just to be friendly. And that oftentimes does not occur um, in the equation. So. Any last word? Well, thank you um, to this group. And I, we're going to close out the day. You've already been patient, but we appreciate your time. We're trying to just t take your morning. But thank you to Shelly, our, our task force chair, is going to come up, close us out, and we will be keeping engaging with you going forward. Thank you all.
So I think you've all heard what the plan is for the coming year, and we just ask that you be continue to be engaged with us. We're going to be diving back in, firing up the four committees, and working on detailed implementation plans and, of course, budgeting. So again, we appreciate your coming and caring. Stay tuned. Stay with us. Uh, I do want to thank Covington uh, for hosting the OVSJ grants, who have supported this with funding. With funding. Uh, the task force members and the advisors, you've done yeoman's duty, uh, and all of you for coming and caring today. So thank you, and we're setting you free.